Sometimes you feel like the world is pressing in on you. But today, you're going to see what to do with that. Because you have all these voices, you watch the news, you go to work, uh, maybe you have family who are very negative about the things of Jesus. Uh, you live in a secular situation. Maybe your parents are not born again. Mm. And they're putting the pressure on you. And you say, well, what do I do in that situation, in that circumstance? And the Holy Spirit shows us how to leave the crowd and get the miracles. If you won't let the crowd press in on you, there are miracles awaiting you with your name on it. And you may be feeling so let down by people all around you. People have disappointed you. And I'm going to tell you, leave the crowd. Call us. We'll, of course, pray with you. And we don't counsel, but you can get on our website. And then the other thing, you could write us a letter. But don't just let the crowd crowd you. You leave the crowd. And I watched, and the teaching you will see today, oh, it shows how miracles came to people who left the crowd, not who stayed in the crowd. I'm telling you, by the time this program is over, you will see there are miracles for me, but I can't let the crowd put me down. I can't run with the crowd. I have to run with Jesus. And it may help you also to discern if you are running with the crowd. Are you breaking down in some areas? Remember, you're not going to get miracles by joining the crowd. <laughs> you're going to have to come out of the crowd. And you say, I want to live in the miraculous, and God wants you to. Now, call us again, I want to say to you, for prayer, because sometimes that's very challenging. And again, you get on our website, or you can write us a letter. But I want you to really get into this teaching. I want the Holy Spirit to just talk to you. I want you, when this program is over, to say, Wow, I see how God has miracles for me, but I see I have to make a choice in this to leave the crowd. Now, I want to look at the first healing Jesus performed when he walked on the earth. And this was a leper. And in your notes, you see this, that he pressed in. It's in Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4. He came out of the crowd. Jesus has just done the Sermon on, on the Mount, and multitudes are there. And he presses in and says to Jesus, he's a leper, so he had a condition that was considered incurable. And you may be here this morning, you may be watching on television, and they've told you, you're incurable. You'll have this all your life, you can never be healed. And that's what they would have said about leprosy. But he came out of the multitude boldly, and said to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And it said that Jesus touched him. Now, you didn't touch lepers because it was contagious. But Jesus touched him and said, I'm willing. Be whole. And then he said, go show yourself to the priest and don't talk to anyone else. Now, that's always bothered me a little bit. Because sometimes when Jesus healed the sick, he would tell them, don't tell anyone. And I would think, oh, they ought to tell everybody because they've gotten healed. But by the end of this sermon, you'll see why he said that on certain occasions. He said, don't tell anyone, but go to the priest. Now, why did he tell him to go to the priest? Because in Jewish law, tradition, teaching, they believed that the man who healed anyone from leprosy was the Messiah. So the, he's telling this leper, go show the priest, make the offering for leprosy, and, you know, uh, you, he, the priest will see, I am the Messiah. It was a sign that he was the Messiah. Now, hardly anyone in the Bible had been healed of leprosy. If you go through Old Testament, you will see two occasions when people were healed from leprosy. One was Moses' sister. And if you remember, she griped a lot. Say yuck three times. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Look at someone. Say, honey, griping doesn't get miracles. And it really doesn't. And so she griped, she groaned. She didn't like Moses' second wife. And she got leprosy. But Moses prayed for her and she was healed. So there is a case of healing. Then Naaman, if you remember Naaman, and you know, he's not a Jew. He's not a believer. And he gets leprosy. And a little Jewish maid in his house tells him, you know, if you go to this prophet, you can be healed. So he goes to the prophet. The prophet gets a word 
And words of knowledge also often bring healings. And so he goes to the prophet and says, you know, I have leprosy. And the prophet gets a word and says, go dip in the river Jordan. How many times? Seven times and you'll be healed. And he's healed and he becomes a believer. He said, I want to take some dirt from Israel home. I'm going to kneel on that. I used to worship idols, but God forgive me. I believe in God. So we have some instances. So this was a tremendous miracle of someone who had an incurable condition. How many of you here this morning would say they've told me what I have is incurable? Stand up. Stand up. Can God cure you today? Can he totally heal you today? Absolutely. Here is an example. But as somebody who got out of the crowd and pressed in. Amen? Now, you can be seated. Let me share something else with you. The multitudes followed him, but when Jesus went to his own hometown, remember, no one was healed. Why weren't they healed? Because they didn't press in. They didn't believe. They didn't honor him. Is that true? And so it's very key to us, our attitude. You know, you just say, well, he's just going to drop on me. Folks, you're going to press in and get what God has. And salvation is for everyone. But if people don't call on the name of Jesus and repent of their sins, invite him into their heart, do they get saved? No, they have to do something. Everybody say, do something. So we begin to see here, there is something you must do in faith. You have to start believing that it's for you and it's now. Everybody say now. So I want to give you two more instances, and they kind of appear right in the same uh, uh, wording or the same places. And this is in Mark 5. And there is a woman who has an issue of blood. When you read about her, she's very pitiful because it never gives her a name. So we say, well, she's no name. Uh, she has no money. She spends it all on doctors, doesn't get better. She's been sick for 12 years. She has a flow of blood that won't stop. So undoubtedly she had no strength. You know, uh, I don't know how she lived. She probably begged. And she's considered unclean because of the flow of blood. It could be a contagious disease. But she hears about Jesus. <laughs> how does faith come? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. What are you hearing this morning? What are you hearing? Say, I'm hearing, I'm hearing. Faith. faith, and faith works. Faith. And so she said, she heard, she said, everybody said, she said, she said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And that's very important what you say. Well, I don't know if healing is for me. I don't know if I'm going to get healed today. Well, folks, your words have great power in them. But she said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And so she heard, she said, everybody say, she heard. She, heard. she said, she said. and she touched. She was active. She activated her faith. That's why I want to lay hands on people today. Because there's something about through the laying on of hands and people getting hands that we activate faith. Everybody say, activate faith. So she touches the hem of his garment and she knew immediately that she was healed. She knew. And Jesus said, who touched me? Because when we get into faith, we touch Jesus and he knows it. Well, I want to touch Jesus. I want Jesus to touch me. We do it by what? Faith. And I asked Bob and Lorraine Martinez to come today. Are you here, Bob and Lorraine? Would you stand up? If you're here, I understand you are here. Yes, back here. And the reason I wanted them to come, a lot of you know who they are. But uh, some years ago in the old church, Bob had a printing business. He was in an accident and his finger was cut off. You can be seated. So they, uh, Lorraine called me and told me about it. And she said, they're putting him in a pressure chamber where it's a hospital to see if they can get the finger back on. But in the pressure chamber, they didn't handle it properly. He had a stroke and a heart attack. And he was in his mid 40s. And so Wally and I went down, and they had all these doctors working around him. Lorraine was there. The children were there. And so we prayed. And I said, Lorraine, he's going to live and not die. And I spoke these words, and he's going to declare the glory of God. So the doctor said, he's not going to live. He won't make it through the night. But he did. But then they said, well, he'll be a vegetable. And I said, Lorraine, he's going to live and not die and declare the glory of God. So every day for 14 days, I went to the hospital. Lorraine would be there sitting beside him. 
and we would speak to Bob, who was like a vegetable, unconscious, Bob Martinez, you shall live and not die and declare the glory of God. And nothing happened. But we believed and we said it. Are you listening to me? Well, I had to leave. And so we had a wild, crazy youth pastor who had a faith. And so he came and I said, I want you for seven days, I'll be gone seven days, I want you to go every day and speak these words to Bob Martinez. I want you to say, Bob Martinez, you shall live and not die and declare the glory of God. He said, okay, I'll do it. So every day he would go up and he would speak to Bob Martinez, unconscious. Lorraine would be there. The seventh day, Jude was kind of upset with God. He said, God, I'd like a sign. And God said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. He said, okay. So he went in. There was Bob, unconscious. There was Lorraine. He said, Bob Martinez, you shall live and not die and declare the glory of God. And Bob opened his eyes, looked at Lorraine. He said, Lorraine, where is Jude? I shall live and not die and declare the glory of God. I'm telling you, there is power in hearing the Word and speaking the Word and acting the Word. Amen. We are so excited because we have the opportunity, you have the opportunity with us to go to Greece and Rome this fall. We're going to see amazing historical places like Mars Hill in Greece. We get to go to the Colosseum. Uh, we get to go to the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Absolutely life-changing, very cool, amazing, transforming things that we get to see. But better than that, Mom, we get on-site teachings. In every place. Yeah. And the Bible, my, my, the book of Acts, so much of New Testament occurs in Rome and occurs in Greece. So you will see things you've never seen before. And we have something very special I've never seen. Yeah. And I've probably have been to Rome 25 times. But the Pope will be giving an address right. there in the big square. Right. And we'll get to see that. I think that'll be very special yeah. for us. And so I just encourage you, get your brochure. And a good thing is to scholarship someone. If you can't go, hey, scholarship someone to go with us. Who do you see when you look in the mirror? Someone you like or someone you like to pick apart? What most of us don't see is the truth. Dr. Wendy Treat's latest book, Take a God Look at Yourself, takes you on a journey into discovering the self-image God created and intended for you to have. Through personal illustrations and sound biblical teachings, you'll learn how to identify the wrong image you have of yourself and exchange it for God's image of you. Along with this insightful book, we'll send you Marilyn's encouraging teaching, Beauty for Ashes. Give God the ashes of any unhealed wounds. In exchange, He'll give you healing and a bright new outlook for your future. We'll also send you the convenient Confident Scriptures bookmark. Take a God look at yourself. You'll never be the same. All this for a gift of $25 or more. Call or click right now to receive this very special life-changing offer. Crowd. I mean, there's a big crowd around him, but she got out and she pressed in. Everybody say, press in. And then in this same occasion, I think this is so unique in this occasion, there's also a man named uh, Jairus, and he's the leader of a synagogue, and his daughter is dying. Now, see, here's a woman who's been sick 12 years. She got healed. Here's a leper who's, you know, sick all his life. He got healed. But this man has a child, and she's dying. And he goes to Jesus before the woman does, before she gets healed. And Jesus is on the way for the healing of his daughter, and this woman interrupts it. Now, if you were the father, couldn't you have been upset? Oh, dear God, we're in a hurry. She's going to die. We've got to get there before she dies. How many of you have ever felt like that? Come on! You know, God, where are you? And, and he stops, heals this woman, and then they come and tell him, your daughter's dead. Can we believe for children, grandchildren? Can we believe for the miraculous? Your daughter's dead. And Jesus encourages him. And I love this about Jesus. I love this about the Holy Spirit. He will encourage you to believe. And so they, he, uh, Jesus says to him, keep believing, keep believing. So Jairus said, okay. And he goes and raises the girl from the dead. Now, which is a greater mir miracle, healing the sick or being raised from the dead? Man, that was quite a miracle. Is that true? But what did both of these people do? He didn't say everybody in the crowd got healed. 
The woman got healed. Jairus' daughter got healed because they pressed in. Everybody say, press in. And that is very, very key. Uh, this week, on Friday, I got to visit the mosque where I had the healing meeting. And I was just there very briefly, and they were having a prayer service. So when it was dismissed, you know, they have the uh, call to prayer and all the things they do, they had a luncheon. And so I was just there for a short time, and so I'm at the luncheon, and these men came up to me. Now remember, these are all Muslim. Everybody say, all Muslim. Remember, I was there teaching the Bible, a miracle of Jesus, praying for the sick. That was two years ago. So I didn't know if anybody would know me from that, but these men began to come over to the table, and uh, they said, oh, Marilyn, I want to tell you, when you were here and prayed, my back was healed. I had a, a malformed spine. My back is whole. And all these people were coming up and saying how Jesus healed them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, healing, it is so wonderful. And it works in every crowd because the name of Jesus heals. Amen. So we have three instances here. But then I think one of the sweetest ones, and I have this here in your notes, is blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10. And if you read about him, there's a big multitude following Jesus. But it said blind Bartimaeus heard it. And it said he was listening for Jesus to come by. And he said, Jesus! The son of David, what did he do? He shouted, he pressed in. Everybody say, press in. And he pressed in. He said, oh. And Jesus said, what do you want? He said, I want to see. And he was healed. Amen? Who got healed in the crowd? Who got healed? In fact, some of the people said, shut up, you're making too much noise. But he didn't shut up. I'm going to tell you today, don't let people tell you what to believe in. You believe in Jesus. Your relatives will tell you you're crazy. You say, yeah, I'm crazy about Jesus. Yes. Amen? And so he was healed. He was totally healed. Wonderful and blind. Dramatic miracle. Dramatic miracle. And what was it? Pressing in. Everybody say pressing in. So we have all kinds of healings here, all kinds of miracles here. But then... The last one I want you to look at, and we're looking at five of them, coming out of the crowd. Everybody say, coming out of the crowd. And this is the man who has a lunatic son. And you know, folks, we have children with all kinds of disorders in this day. All kinds. And uh, we must believe and not just accept what the world says. It's very, very key time. So Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration and the man comes to him, and this is in Matthew 17, and he said, oh, you know, my son, he throws himself into the fire. He's just so crazy. And you know, you may be here this morning. You have loved ones with mental problems. You may have mental problems. But remember, he says, I want you to be whole, spirit, soul, and body. Everybody say spirit, spirit, soul, body. And this is a good thing to put on your list if you think there are some mental problems. And he said, you know, I brought him to the disciples. He didn't heal him. And Jesus heals the lunatic boy. Amen? Now you say, well, I don't know if mental problems can be healed. Well, that's too late to tell me. Because my father was in a mental hospital. They said he would never come out. My mother got saved, spirit-filled, and crazy over Jesus. And within one year, he came out. Hallelujah. Amen. And he got saved, water baptized. He's in heaven today because my mother believed in Jesus. Amen? Amen. And she pressed in. I mean, it wasn't a simple thing because I was there when the psychologist, psychiatrist told her, he will never come out, he'll never be all right. And they said to her one day, your religion put him in here. She said, no, it's going to bring him out. <laughs> I mean, she didn't miss a beat. Pressing in. Everybody say pressing in. These are beautiful examples. But there's something that Peter did I like. You know, he said, Jesus, if you say come, I'll start out of the boat and walk on the water. Just one word. Everybody say one word. Do you realize how powerful the word is? Just one word. And Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped out. And you say, well, but he began to sink, but he got out. Nobody else did it. I'd rather press in. Amen? 
It may be sink some, but get back up <laughs> and go on with God, then not believe and sit and say, well, I don't think miracles are for today. Oh, shut up. Yeah. Press in, get your miracle. Yeah. Amen. Now, three things this morning before I lay hands on you. Three things I want you to really get hold of. This is not in your notes. Some of it is, but I want you to get these three things. They're very important. Number one, put a demand on the word and the anointing. Put a demand on it. Say it's for me. Healing is for me. A miracle is for me. I believe September 4th there's a miracle with my name on it. The second thing is we're going to worship during our healing time of laying on of hands. Everybody say worship. That leper came and worshiped Jesus. There is something about worship that gets us out of our own mind and emotions into the presence of God. Is that true? I mean, I can be out of it and feel depressed and every problem, but I can worship and it just breaks it off. Amen? Everybody say worship. And then this morning, you're going to be healed. But be careful who you go back and tell. Be careful. Jesus said to that leper, don't tell anyone, go to the priest. Why? And I gave you a scripture here and it's very key for you. And it's in Acts 4.23. And being let go, they went to their own companions. Their basic companions. That's so weak. Dear me, you're weak this morning. <laughs> Say companions. And reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Now, when the disciples went back, and they really gave a place of victory, and they'd been very persecuted, who did they go to? They went to their own people. Everybody say, own people. Now, let me tell you something this morning. If that leper had gone to just everybody before he went to the priest, they could have talked him out of it. Have you ever had somebody talk you out of your healing? Have you ever talked somebody out of their healing? Folks, you need to stay in a faith crowd. Everybody say faith crowd. Let me tell you, for close friends, I don't hang around whiners. They're contagious. I hang around risky faith people. And they're a lot riskier than I am. You think I am. I'm nothing compared to some of the people I hang around. They're raising the dead. I've never raised the dead. They're seeing all kinds of blind eyes open. I talked to somebody last night with the most radical miracles I've ever heard, and it's true, and they have a clean life. Are you hearing me? That's why you need to be in church. You don't need to hang around all the Well, I got healed yesterday. Well, did you really? Is healing really for today? Well, let's see you. And you're trying to stand in faith, and they will try to talk you out of it. Are you hearing me? You need to stay in a faith crowd. I witness to people. I love to lead people to Christ. But folks, I got to have risky faith friends. And I like to come to our church. This is a risky faith place. Amen. And so stay in that kind of an atmosphere. So let's look at what's number one. Everybody say, press in to the Word and the anointing. What's number two? Worship. Put your hands up. Say, Jesus. I worship you. And what's number three? Stay with the faith crowd. Everybody say, stay in the faith crowd. Amen. And those are the three keys, I believe, this morning that will help you receive your healing, receive your miracle. I believe for you today. Amen. Who do you see when you look in the mirror? Someone you like or someone you like to pick apart? What most of us don't see is the truth. Dr. Wendy Treat's latest book, Take a God Look at Yourself, takes you on a journey into discovering the self-image God created and intended for you to have. Through personal illustrations and sound biblical teachings, you'll learn how to identify the wrong image you have of yourself and exchange it for God's image of you. Along with this insightful book, we'll send you Marilyn's encouraging teaching, Beauty for Ashes. Give God the ashes of any unhealed wounds. In exchange, He'll give you healing and a bright new outlook for your future. We'll also send you the convenient Confident Scriptures bookmark. Take a God look at yourself. You'll never be the same. All this for a gift of $25 or more. 
Call or click right now to receive this very special life-changing offer. Did you know that one prayer can change your life forever? You say, one prayer. Yes, one prayer. When I was 16 years old, I prayed one prayer that is still changing my life. I'm in my 70s, and not only is it changing my life daily and has for all these years, but I have eternal life because of that one prayer. Oh, that prayer transforms everything. You say, well, what is the prayer? And I'll tell you what it is. I invited Jesus to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I repented of my sins. And he came into my heart and he's never left me. And he will never leave you either because the Bible says, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you eternal life. Are you ready to pray that prayer? Maybe you've never prayed it. Maybe you've prayed it, but your life is out of sync. Hey, you can pray and recommit your life to him. Pray with me right now. Mean this with your heart. Say, Father, I believe you love me. You have a wonderful plan for my life. I am sorry for my sins and the wrong things I have done. Please forgive me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. I have faith in his blood. Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Did you pray that prayer? Your life is changed and transformed. You will never be the same. Did you recommit your life? Expect transformation. And above all, know that your name is written in heaven and not in hell.